today I want to tell you about the new release we're hopefully having real soon. Eight or two public students. How many people here have used public students? I want to tell a bit about the history of Big Studio. A Big Studio always has been oriented as an enterprising oriented development environment. It was always closed for enterprises, not like uh, most of the other small talks, more uh, academic, but it was really focused on business. In the late 80s, early 90s, when I first started working with a big studio, it was called Anthem. It was OS2 or Windows based. It had its own VM, which was an interpreter. And very important, it was file based. I think it was one of the only small tools at the time. I think it was file based. That around, I think, 93, the project was renamed to Object Studio. And until 2007, there have been releases from 4 up to uh, 7. I think we're now at 713. The product became only Windows based. And I think it was one of the first uh, development environments that was actually 95 certified. It still had its own VM, which was still interpreted. And it was file based, of course. Then around 2004, mid 2004, our friend Georg started a project to run Object Studio in the Visual Works environment. So run Object Studio on top of the Visual Works VM. And around 2005 we had the first alpha releases. And in 2007 Object Studio 8 was released, which was running on top of Visual Works. It was still Windows based, because all the UI is Windows based. And the 8.1 release, the previous release, was Windows Vista certified. <coughs> you can choose now in Public Studio 8.x to work file based or you can work image based like Visual Works does or most of the other small talks. 8.2 won't be Windows 7 certified, but the next release probably will. So I first want to have a talk about the virtual machine. We now have three products running on top of VisualWorks virtual machine, which is Public Studio 8.2, VisualWorks 7.7, and Web Velocity 1.0, which was presented on Wednesday by Michael. <coughs> the fact that we run on top of the VisualWorks VM means that many of the changes that happen with VisualWorks also benefits the Ubiq Studio environment and also the Web Velocity <coughs> environment. So I'm going to I'm note some of them now. First, the Visual Works engine will be Unicode. There will be better support for international, internationalization. Store will be running on Glorp. Then we'll discuss Glorp a bit more later. We'll have atomic loading for Store. The base are being enhanced. There's a new prerequisite engine which is easier to use, which has a better interface. Uh, the tools were enhanced, and we have new logos and icons, as you will see as the slide progress. Of course, we support Seaside 3.0 now, and Glorp is fully supported because all three platforms use Glorp for the moment. Web Velocity uses Glorp. Store in Visual Works uses Glorp and the Object Studio mapping tool also uses Glorp. So Glorp is really a very important part of our current development. For Object Studio 8.2, we have a new look. Uh, the modeling tool is, uh, how do you say this? It's back in front of the, it's back in the picture with Object Studio because it has been neglected for a long, long time and we have fixed a lot of bugs. We made it work on Object Studio 8.1 and it's the first official release actually now. 
We also did work on Mapping Tool, which was a complete new tool, which is based, like I said, on Grore. The first release only supports uh, active record stuff, but we are currently working on making a whole Grore based uh, mapping tool which you can actually which will support all kinds of uh, mapping stores. And also, <coughs> the paper tool will be Unicode. Uh, we might have an ANSI version, but that's not sure yet. It will be Unicode this time. This is the OBX Studio Launcher, it was installed in X to A.1. And this is how it looks like in A.2. The hardhead will disappear, however. It happened this week. <laughs> Hopefully next week it's done. Then the modeling tool. The modeling tool exists primarily of object modeling, code generation and parameter engineering. I will discuss them all a little bit, very shortly, just to give you an idea what's in there. We first have a use case explorer. <coughs> in the use case explorer, you can define actors and the use cases for each actor. As you define the use cases in your text, as you see here on the, <coughs> as you see on the text box, you can define use use cases and extend use cases. And you can build a tree, which you see here in this window, about relationships between the different use cases, how they extend, how they use them. As you type the text, you can also start defining possible domain objects. You select them, you click on them, and you can say, okay, this is a possible domain object. These domain objects can be used in the following and that's the CRC Explorer. As you define domain objects, they are created here. And then you can start defining responsibilities for each of them and eventual collaborators. You don't have to use these, but they can help you in your environment. As you explore relationships between possible domain objects, you can also start making interaction diagrams. These interac interaction diagrams can then be coupled to your use cases. And right now, they're just a documentation tool, but we intend to do more of these later on. We then have probably the most important part, which is the design explorer. In the design explorer, we <coughs> define different sub models, and each sub model contains a process unit. A sub model of let me say different. A class can be in different submodels. And the most useful uh, way to define it is actually using the object diagram. <coughs> so you simply draw your classes, you add instance variables, you type them mostly in this case, which will be used for code generation and which can do checking it afterwards, and you make your relationships. All this information. is also automatically updated in the Design Explorer. So you, it, you can work with the Design Explorer, you can work with the object diagram. Once you create code, you will see here on the right that the code will also be reflected in the model. So you can while you use, let it use the class browser or the model tool to view. File-based or package-based. File-based was the old way. We support package-based, so you support, create all your code in one package. I think put it on the slide. You can also support namespaces. The only limitation right now is that the namespace has to be a sub-namespace of Objet Studio. We cannot generate. At the moment, we can generate the Visual Works namespace. Now we have change notification events, change and update events. But the next step will be that we will support announcements. And you can define 
point of object verification. So if, for instance, if you define an uh, instance variable as a string, if you assign a value to it, we will check whether it's a string. It's not a string, it's so a error. And also you can define which method you want to generate. Uh, that is, that is uh, initialization methods. You can leave them out as you don't need them, or you can create them yourself. The templates that are being created for the model, for the code, are hard code, but are is documented how you can change it. So you need to change some methods to, if you want to generate your own code. It's a round of engineering tool, which means that once you generate the code, and you start running it, you see that you get some bugs. As you change them in the class version or the debugger, the changes are reflected in the model tool itself. And you can also import existing small talk classes, which you know they are there and you need them. You can import them into the model tool and use them there. Then the mapping tool. The mapping tool is an object object relational mapping based on Blorp. The first one is active record based, as I told you. And it offers you the ability, as you develop, to see the rows which are on the tables you want to map. So we have a function that you say, okay, show me the first 50 rows of this table. And we show you the raw data as it comes into the small talk. We have a logging ability. So you can see as you have to map the code and you want to see what's happening, you, see, you can see in the transcript middle uh, how fast it was, what was retrieved and so on. We have attribute read write debug uh, settings. So on an instance we can say, okay, we want to read debug. And as you test your mapping, at the time that the instance variable is set, we draw the debugger and you can inspect what's happening, what's the value in the different kinds of, uh, in the different instances. <coughs> And we can also inspect objects retrieved from the database. So if you have a mapping, we have a function to, that you can do it here. So this is how the GUI now looks. If you have a mapping, you can stand on, you can select the class, you do an inspect, and it will show you 50 rows of that class. <coughs> That's objects how they were retrieved. So you can immediately see what's the data you need, how the relationships and how they're going on without having to generate any codes. The GUI is, <coughs> in the talk you have an atlas as we defined, which is, it will also be normally the package where you generate your code in. We have database settings. We have the classes that we are going to map. We have tables. And if you select the class, you will see here the classes that are referenced. We have, if a table is selected, the reference table, private table, if we have the necessary database information, the foreign keys constraint, or right. And we also see how the mapping was done. So here, for instance, you see direct mappings and foreign key mappings. In the current version, the active record point line, we normally take a database, we select the tables we want to use, we generate the classes accordingly, which is on a one-on-one -on -one base, if the foreign key constraints are right, we make the mappings bidirectional, so we can go any direction. And then we generate the script which you can use in your development. Once you have created the script, uh, you don't need anything from the mapping tool anymore. Because it's work, you simply load the script and you can work without, in your runtime you can work without the mapping tool. Other stuff that's new in Objects Studio 82 is some database enhancements. We support log processing in Oracle and DB2 now, or better support for it. Uh, we enhance store procedure support in Oracle, DB2, Sybase, and ODBC. We support better ghost variable in the wrappers of uh, Objects Studio. And on ODBC, we now also support. Uh, input and output parameters for store procedures. Other things that were changed was we now support drag and drop between two three views. 
Previously, we only put the drag and drop within the preview, but now we can, because we need it for the mapping tool, we have support for that. And on the refactoring browser, we have some tiny enhancements. Uh, we have an edit button for controls, because in Apex Studio, as you create a control, it creates a global, which was put on the launcher, and if you have a lot of that, it's very difficult to find the right one. So we added a button in the right button of the refactoring browser. If you have a class selected, which is a subclass of controller, you can <coughs> call the editor from there. It will open the design so you can change your GUI. We gave the source that um, for the Logic Studio compiler a special call. Logic Studio still has some uh, own behaviors of certain class or certain methods. And for this we use a special compiler. And if the source tab contains a drill wheel, then we know we, that we are using the Objet Studio compiler for this class. Object Studio for instance, <coughs> if you have a dictionary and you do an add, it will return the, uh, the item you added. So it's a special behavior. For this, we change the source code to use the Open Studio uh, compiler from at semicolon to OS underscore at semicolon. And this is shown in the transform code source tab. And you, in the previous version, this tab was also uh, normally closed, so you didn't, you didn't see it that code was changed. And now we made it, uh, we added an icon and made it bold. So you know the source code is different from the transform code. And you know that there's a different behavior. We had some problems during development that dictionaries weren't behaving as we expected. And sometimes it took quite a while to find out that an OS underscore app wasn't happening or was happening when it shouldn't be happening. So this helps development. Then we have Public Studio 803, what's in life for the future. We will enhance modeling and mapping tools. We have a project coming which is called DLCC GUI for us at the moment. There hasn't an official name right now. Uh, this will change the way of the studio talks with windows, especially for the GUI part. We try to use DLCC to make all the window calls and hopefully this way will be better to uh, react quicker on updates in Windows, new regions, and so on. We try to make that interface more useful. We don't know whether it will be in the next release, however, because it's a serious project, it will take a long time. And as last part, we will be enhancing the native object studio tools like the designer. Hopefully, we'll get some time to put work in, maybe the report in, or so, just like that. So. I think that was it. Do you have any questions?